All right, well, welcome everyone to uh, a new day, a new day of studying the church together. So you will probably recall, uh, you will probably recall that last week as we talked about uh, the early church and we talked about some of the uh, different things that were characteristic of the early church, uh, one of the things that we said uh, was that there was a lot of harmony in that uh, early Christian body. Uh, from the very beginning, there was a whole lot of unity uh, in the early church. As a matter of fact, uh, looking specifically at about the first 50 years or so of the church, uh, we find a lot of um, a lot of things that would be characteristic of what seems like a, a movement of God. The kind of unity and prayer and, and uh, care for one another uh, that we were uh, thinking of. That's something that we would be like, yeah, that, that sounds like uh, God was in the middle of all that. But unfortunately, uh, as we talk through church history today, uh, we will find a lot of the ways in which the church has broken down over the years. Uh, a lot of the ways in which uh, power dynamics have started to uh, make the church struggle. Um, these are the conversations of scandal in the church. And so as we go through this material today, We'll start off with kind of a, a brief reminder at some of the stuff that we looked at before, uh, but then we will launch into, um, I'm going to try to compress 20, uh, uh, 2,000 years of church history into uh, about 50 minutes. So we're going to find out how well that works. Uh, as always, uh, if you have anything, I had a couple questions this morning. Um, if you have anything, pause me. So... Out of the death and resurrection of Christ came the Christian church. Uh, that's in your book on page 207. The church was born out of the focus on the person of Jesus. Now, because we had such a heavy focus on Jesus as the Christ, the early church kind of had to split off from the Jewish faith. Um, there's such a distinctive difference in that way from what Judaism is. Uh, and so we kind of start off uh, and we, we kind of break off and we form our own thing. Following the resurrection, uh, the Holy Spirit is given to the apostles, and Pentecost is basically considered like the birthday of the early church. Uh, so even now, when we celebrate Pentecost, we're essentially celebrating uh, nearly 2,000 years of the church's birth. So we start off with Paul and the other apostles spreading out into the world and taking that message of Jesus Christ uh, into the world around them. Uh, they all leave from, uh, well, the 12 apostles all leave from that main uh, location in Jerusalem, and they all spread out into the rest of the world. Uh, I'm, I know I'm breezing through these early slides, and it's just because we've already talked about a lot of this at length. Then we also talk about uh, the spread of Christianity into kind of uh, the remainder of the known world. Not so much just within Israel, but well outside of Israel. Uh, especially, you see here, uh, this, uh, this is a map of the three different missionary journeys of Paul. And as Paul went through, uh, he would go and he would spread the gospel to uh, all of these different regions throughout uh, what we would now consider to be uh, Turkey or Asia Minor, and then Greece. So all of this stuff takes place very rapidly following uh, the time of Christ. <clears throat> but then the apostles die off. The twelve apostles die off. Paul dies off, and we all and they all kind of go, okay. Now what are we supposed to do? Uh, what are we supposed to do now that the apostles are no longer here? So for the first uh, about. 500 years of the church, uh, everybody is united. There is one church. Uh, there is no, uh, there's really no special name on there. It's not the Roman Catholic Church or the Eastern Orthodox Church or the Methodist Church or any of that kind of stuff. It's just the church. For, a, for almost that first 500 years, we just have the church. So we start off kind of with an unbroken line. Uh, just one church all the way up to 
about 450 AD. And following that time, we have our uh, first major church split. Uh, in 450, we have a group of churches that break off from that main church, and they call themselves the Oriental Orthodox Church. So about 450, we have this break, but I will also say that the Oriental Orthodox Church is pretty small. There's not really a, a, a big group of churches that breaks off at this point, and they break off over some theological differences. Uh, they look at the way that the church is going, and they say, well, we think that uh, this is not 100% accurate. What they break off about uh, is what we would call um, uh, monophysitism. Uh, I do not expect you to know what that is. Uh, I don't expect you to memorize that or anything like that. But what they break off about is we have talked before about how the church teaches that there are two natures of Christ. There's the divine nature and the human nature, and that those two are in perfect harmony with one another. But what the Oriental Orthodox Church teaches is that there is now one nature that has been formed in Jesus Christ, that the divine and human natures come together to make one single nature in Jesus Christ. So uh, there's, a, there's a pretty significant theological difference in, in that uh, when, we, when it comes to our understanding of who Jesus is. So up until this point, uh, everybody is joined together. But I'll tell you, God does something new in his church about every 500 years. When we look at church history, about every 500 years, something new takes place, uh, something drastically different than what was uh, the case before it. And when we get to about the four to five hundreds, we have a new movement called monasticism. Monasticism is not something that's in your PowerPoint, uh, but you are going to need to know about monasticism. You have heard before of a monk. Well, a monk is somebody who practices monasticism. And the reason that this movement arises within Christianity right around the 450s or so is that uh, following about 300, 350-ish, uh, the church becomes legal in the Roman Empire. For those first 300 years, uh, Christianity was forbidden in Rome. You could not be a part of the Christian faith and expect to be okay. You were going to face persecution, and you were probably going to die as a result of being called a Christian. But following that time, when Christianity was all of a sudden okay, uh, their uh, massive numbers start to come into the church. Basically, once the church is legal, then all kinds of people decide they want to become Christians. And so the church grows really, really rapidly. But the problem is that the people who were already in the church find themselves kind of going, okay, wait a minute. I don't think that these people who are starting to come into the church now actually understand what Christianity is supposed to be. And so monasticism is this kind of movement back toward um remembering what the Christian faith is supposed to be all about. It's, uh, these people actually went out into the desert, they withdrew from society, and they tried to just recapture uh, what relationship with Christ was. So this movement called monasticism is really what we would probably say uh, was that first major uh, change in the church. Uh, I say God does something new about every 500 years, that's about what it is uh, when we would look at kind of the major thing that happens in the first 500 years is that we have this monastic movement. 
So a couple of things that are uh, pretty significant about this uh, early period of the church, uh, we would say that the church fathers are some of the most significant figures that show up in early church history. Church fathers are these um, absolute geniuses of the faith who really, really understand what it is uh, to be a Christ follower and who understand um, the deeper things of theology. These are the guys who are actually responsible for some of the things that we teach to this very day. And it's not so much that we are not teaching the things that the apostles taught, because you could start to discern some of that from what I'm saying. That's not what I'm trying to get at. I would still say that we do teach the things that the apostles taught. But as these groups start to grow, as the church starts to grow, and new ideas start to come into the church, then uh, we have to kind of narrow down what it is that we're talking about when we are uh, discussing the topic of God. We can't necessarily say that Jesus is uh, the same as Buddha or the same as Muhammad or any of these kinds of things. We have to make sure that we are staying true to what Christianity teaches. And so a lot of what the uh, church fathers do is they take us back to the teachings of the apostles. They go back to the teachings of the prophets and, uh, and the Old Testament, and they try to make sure that we are staying true to what is actually authentic Christianity. So a lot of these first few hundred years of church history uh, are spent trying to answer really two solid questions. First of all, who is Jesus? We want to make sure that we are teaching the same thing that the apostles taught about who Jesus himself is. We want to make sure that we are uh, we're understanding whether he is human or he is divine whether he was flesh and blood or he was spirit. These are some of the things that come up within those first 500 years of church history. And we have to make sure that we're actually teaching together. We're teaching in unity. Second thing that is uh, asked is, what is the Trinity? How do we actually understand what God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit means? Is God... Uh, are there three gods? Uh, is that what we're trying to teach? Is there one God who just kind of shows up in different ways throughout human history? Uh, those are some of the major questions that we're trying to answer in those first 300 years um, and, and actually extending into those first 500 years, I suppose. So we want to look uh, real briefly at three of some of the major figures in early church history. First of all, we talk about Tertullian. And Tertullian was um, Tertullian still has a major influence on the church to this very day. Uh, very few have had the kind of influence on Christian theology that Tertullian had. He was from North Africa, and actually, all three of the guys that we're going to talk about today were from North Africa. Um, we tend to very falsely associate uh, early Christianity with like a European kind of thing, but the reality is, all of our theology is very, very heavily rooted in uh, what was taught to us by these guys in North Africa. Tertullian has been referred to as the father of Latin theology. Now, when I say that, what I mean is basically those churches that are heavily rooted in a Latin, the Tertullian uh, is kind of the guy that they look back to. And so the Roman Catholic Church, for instance, is very, very heavily rooted in the teachings of Tertullian. Tertullian was the first one to use the word Trinity in his writings uh, to describe God. Now, Tertullian is living within the first uh, about 200 years of church history. So again, it's not to say that this concept of the Trinity had not been taught before, but rather to say that following Tertullian's time was where we actually had a word to describe it, was where we actually had a word that really summed up really well what this concept was. You'll actually find that uh, with at least two of the three of the guys that we talk about, they don't necessarily have a sainthood status. Uh, you know, in the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox churches especially, um, somebody being made a saint is a very significant uh, time. It's a very significant thing for them to experience. But um, Tertullian and Origen, who we'll talk about in just a minute, they were not actually made saints at any time. 
they had some um, some beliefs that later church councils condemned, uh, but we actually would still say uh, their core teachings uh, were very much um, very much orthodox and uh, and actually are what we still would teach to this very day. So even though Origen, uh, even though Tertullian was not actually made a saint, he's still very well respected among theologians even to now. And so we also talk about Origen himself. Origen uh, was from Alexandria in Egypt and has been referred to as the greatest mind that the church has ever produced. Uh, absolutely brilliant man. Uh, he wrote about 6,000 volumes in his lifetime. 6,000 volumes. Can you even imagine having the kind of intelligence to produce 6,000 volumes of work? Um, now, to be fair, what is probably being referred to there is scrolls, uh, that he would have pr produced about 6,000 different scrolls of his knowledge and understanding. But even so, scrolls could hold a lot of text. And so when we say that Origen produced 6,000 volumes, this is something that is absolutely unparalleled. Uh, and actually, I have uh, one of Origen's works right here. Uh, Origen wrote a book called On First Principles. Um, now it's two books because we're trying to, um, because this actually has some uh, explanatory notes from the guy who translated it into English. But Origen was actually one who was uh, so intelligent that he continues to have an influence on theologians today. And actually some of the other greatest minds in church history um, would go back and say that he was the one who influenced them the most. He does a lot of work on free will, on helping us to understand right teachings about God. And he is said to have possessed such a comprehensive knowledge of Scripture uh, that he was brought in to teach bishops, church leadership. He was the one that was brought in to teach them what the Scriptures actually had to say. Now, Origen spent most of his life not as a clergyman, uh, but as somebody who was just a, a regular lay part of the church. Um, so for him to be brought in to teach the bishops what Scripture was talking about is pretty significant. Some of the uh, people who were his students uh, through the years would say that his knowledge of Scripture was so comprehensive that it was basically as if he had written it himself. Uh, which is just astonishing to think about. I mean, I work as a biblical scholar, um, but I still will admit there are plenty of things about the scriptures that I don't necessarily understand just yet. Um, can you imagine somebody describing you in that way as if you had basically written the Bible? Uh, Arjun was also one who was used to... Um, to bring people back into the faith when they had strayed. Now, I'm not just talking about any old person. I'm talking about people who had started to teach false doctrines. Now, what the early church would do is they would actually bring Origen in so that he could begin to uh, dissect some of the thinking that was going on there and begin to lead these people into appropriate understandings of God's word. I think this is what really blows me away about this. Think about how much thought has to go into something before you are going to teach it. Think about how much you have to be dedicated and convicted about something before you're going to go teach it to the world. Uh, obviously, when we talk about teaching at a college level, for instance, you have to have at the very least a master's degree, but most of the time your professors are going to have doctorates. They are going to have spent years and years and years of study just so that they were finally uh, equipped to be able to teach that particular subject. And what's so amazing to me about Origen is that people, these church leaders bring him in to say, this person is not teaching an appropriate doctrine. And Origen actually does change their minds. He actually is so smart. <laughs> He's so uh, educated in the scriptures that he actually does convince them of what is appropriate uh, according to what the Bible has to say. That just blows me away. Uh, and even to this very day, I find myself 
and many of us find ourselves looking back to origin um, to understand really what it is to teach the scriptures. So we've talked about Tertullian and Origen, and finally we want to talk about Augustine a little bit. We've already talked a little bit about Augustine's work because we've talked about his doctrine of original sin. Origen, uh, Augustine went back to the scriptures and, uh, and found himself um, pulling from them this idea that uh, every one of us has some sort of um, corruption, some sort of taintedness as a result of sin. Not necessarily our own sin, but the sin that uh, our ancestors have committed, uh, specifically Adam and Eve. So when Augustine looked at the scriptures, uh, he expounded on what this uh, idea of original sin is, that every single one of us has some sort of natural corruption from sin. Uh, Augustine was from Hippo in North Africa. He was largely responsible for changing the way that the world thought about time. If you were a philosopher, in the um, first couple hundred years uh, following Christ's life, then you taught that the world was eternal, that the universe was eternal, that it had no beginning and it would never have any end. But Augustine said, no, that's not the case. That's a mistaken, I, that's a mistaken understanding. And it's actually thanks to guys like Augustine that um, people in the world outside of the church started to think of the world as uh, as something that was finite, as something that had a definite beginning. So guys like Stephen Hawking actually still owe their understanding of uh, time having a beginning to people like Augustine. He did a lot of work on predestination, uh, and he spent a lot of his life really wrestling with, um, with the scriptures, with God, uh, some have said that Augustine's influence was such that um, basically his influence on the church is secondary only to Scripture itself. That's a pretty big thing to say. Uh, it's a pretty big deal. If you want to check out uh, some of the um, work of Augustine, you can find some in, uh, he has a book called The Confessions. Um, and you can see this is, this is one biography on Augustine. Um, you can get into a whole lot of stuff when you talk about these guys. Um, extensive work has been done on their lives just because of how much of an influence they had on the early church and on the church today. So we have uh, these moments where uh, we find, again, God does something new in his church about every 500 years. And in 1054, we have the first really major church split. And the church has this schism, and it's actually, um, if you talk about a, uh, a branch of the church, then you're talking about a denomination. And I think I touched on that in my recorded lecture for this week. Uh, anything that is a branch of the Christian church is a denomination. Uh, so a, a lot of people, for instance, my grandmother will say, um, I went to uh, one of those churches that was that uh, Baptist religion, and I got to go, no, it's not a religion, it's a denomination. Um, so denominations uh, start to really form um, at this time because we have this big, big church split between what becomes the Eastern Orthodox Church and then what becomes the Roman Catholic Church. So in 1054, we have this big, big church split. Uh, now keep in mind, up until this time, the church was united. There wasn't any sort of, um, there wasn't a Roman Catholic church. There wasn't an Eastern Orthodox church. It was all just one church, and they all worked together. 
Now that um, that tends to upset some folks when I say that because there are a lot of people, um, especially who were raised in the Roman Catholic Church, who were taught that the Roman Catholic Church was the church that Jesus himself actually founded. Um, but that's actually not the case. Jesus founded one church. And then from that one church, by the time 1054 comes around, we have this split into these two major factions. It's actually kind of funny because the names that they chose for themselves are actually like digs at each other. So you talk about, we've talked about before this idea of orthodoxy, uh, right doctrine is what that word means. Well, uh, or right teaching would be an accurate way of understanding that as well. So when this one group calls itself the Eastern Orthodox Church, what they're saying is, we're the ones who have the right teaching. And this word Catholic actually means universal. And so the Roman Catholic Church, uh, when they take this name, they're saying, we're the ones who are the actual universal church. And so to this very day, uh, there are some really, really big divisions that still exist between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church. So why do we have this big schism? Uh, well, first of all, uh, we would look at the theological reasons for the schism, and we would also look at the political reasons for the schism. Again, I say that when you start to get into churches of uh, into a church of this kind of size, um, the reality is that a lot of power dynamics start to come into play. So uh, once we see the church um, getting into these kinds of um, getting into this kind of place where it has such power, then uh, people come into the church for the wrong reasons. So when you have a, uh, a church that is basically able to call the shots in who's going to be king and who's not, who's going to uh, who's going to marry whom, um, there's some struggle there with the power dynamics. And there are people who enter into the church just because they want to be powerful rather than because they want to have a relationship with Christ. So theologically, why does the church split? Well, it actually splits over a tiny little clause that's in a creed. So they are writing this creed. They're trying to figure out um, a, a way that they can uh, determine, uh, a way that they can kind of unite themselves on uh, what the Holy Spirit uh, has as far as his role is concerned in the Trinity. The one church says uh, that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, and that's it. That's actually the Eastern Orthodox position. The Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. The Roman Catholic Church's position is the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, is that enough of a reason uh, to actually split the whole church? Probably not. Probably not. Uh, the reality is, that these two churches actually teach this to this very day, that the Eastern Orthodox Church still teaches that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, and that's it. The Roman Catholic Church still teaches to this very day that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Uh, they still will hold their ground uh, on this particular issue. But the reality is, uh, probably the reason the church split in 1054 was for political reasons. Because... Uh, at this point, the Pope, uh, the guy who is the head of the church in Rome, um, the Pope has started to really consolidate power. And everybody has kind of been able to go, okay, uh, we, we choose to listen to what the Bishop of Rome has to say. That's really what the Pope is, is the Bishop of Rome. Um, all of these churches start to go, we're going to side with the Pope. Or we're going to side with uh, this other group. We're going to side with this. The Eastern Orthodox Church is actually led by a council of bishops, uh, seven different bishops. And they all come together to make these decisions that the Pope just kind of makes on his own. So we have this development in Christianity uh, that is called Christendom. Christendom is this idea that basically we have moved away from just being the church for the sake of being the church and have instead started to actually influence political uh, movements. We have started to exercise some political power. 
Christendom is not something that we find in the United States today, for instance. Uh, the church can't say, um, we want this guy to be the next president of the United States, and that's it. Um, there are still churches that are heavily involved in political activity, for instance, but they can't just call the shots. The way it was in this time, the church could say, this guy is going to be king, and that was all there was to it. Uh, he was going to be the king. So this um, this power dynamic starts to become a really, really big problem for the early, for the um, church around 1054. And these tensions continue uh, between these two different branches of the church to this very day. Uh, and it really doesn't look like, at least in our lifetimes, that we're going to see any sort of resolution between these two branches. The Eastern Orthodox branch is still really united uh, and refuses to acknowledge that the Pope has any sort of authority in the church. Um, whereas the Roman Catholic Church is actually the largest of all the denominations in the church and has given rise to a bunch of other denominations uh, for various reasons. So, following 1054, we have a period of somewhat rest and relaxation. But again, God does something new every 500 years or so in the church. And right around the hmm, 1500s, uh, we have this big, big change in the church. In the 1400s, the Roman Catholic Church starts this practice called selling indulgences. And uh, what happens is that they have this doctrine of purgatory. You may have heard of purgatory before. Purgatory is this idea that basically between earth and heaven, there's this kind of middle ground. And if you die as a part of the Roman Catholic Church, then you have to spend some time hanging out in this purgatory area. Uh, and basically, you're burning. Uh, you burn in purgatory and you're essentially burning off the sin uh, that was a part of you before you enter into the presence of God in heaven. It sounds awful. Uh, but this was something that was taught uh, very, very strongly at this time. So what, what happens is the Roman Catholic Church starts selling indulgences, and these indulgences are supposed to be that if you buy... Um, this little piece of paper from the Roman Catholic Church, and somebody's going to pray, and your loved one is going to move directly from purgatory into heaven. Now, if you are a peasant in the 1400s, and all you know is uh, that your mom just passed, and you're grieving, and you um, have been told that if you pay $100 or whatever it is, that she'll get to go to heaven, uh, that she'll get to go directly to heaven rather than spending however many years being tortured in this purgatory place. Um, are you going to find the money to do that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so a lot of people, they don't really know a whole lot. Uh, they don't really know any different. So they go, well, yeah, we need to buy these indulgences so that we can get our loved ones into heaven. And Martin Luther comes along. Martin Luther is a priest, and he uh, examines the scriptures for himself, and he says, uh, this is not an okay practice. Uh, this is something that is clearly a, a, a power and a money grab on the part of the church. So he comes along, and we have this movement known as the Protestant Reformation. And out of the Protestant Reformation comes churches like the Lutherans. And the Lutherans have their name because that was the church that was founded by Martin Luther after uh, he uh, started to bring his grievances before the church. 
Now, the church, of course, is not very happy that Martin Luther uh, decides that he wants to take them on. So um, they put him on trial and they say, you got to stop teaching this stuff. Um, he, of course, refuses and they kick him out. But he's already been ordained. Uh, and so it's kind of difficult for them to say, therefore, um, he was never the right guy in the first place. Um, Luther is tried for heresy, and uh, they can't necessarily get him all that easily. Um, and uh, the people themselves start to listen to what Martin Luther has to say. So it's actually from uh, Martin Luther's teachings that things like Lutheranism come about. All of this stuff that takes place in here is for the purpose of going back and um, making sure that the church is actually held accountable for its actions, which is something that actually uh, the apostles themselves taught from the very beginning, that the church should be held accountable for what it does. So we have these sweeping changes that come about, and they uh, result in what we call the Protestant Reformation. So the Lutherans are a part of uh, Lutherans come out of this movement. We also have groups like uh, the Anabaptists. From which the current Baptists come. We have the Anglican Church that comes out of this. And we have the Presbyterian Church that comes out of this. That's not um, that's not the limit of the churches that come out of this. It's just trying to kind of break them down into semi-major groups. Um, some of these have theological reasons that they break off from the Roman Catholic Church. One of them in particular has a really bad reason for breaking off from the church, and that's the Anglican Church. The Anglican Church, uh, you may recall Henry VIII. Henry VIII... Uh, wants to get a divorce. And at the time, England is a Catholic country. So uh, Henry VIII goes to the Pope and he says, hey, Pope, uh, I would like to get a divorce. And the Pope says, no, I'm not going to grant you a divorce. So Henry VIII says, okay, well, if you're not going to grant me a divorce, I'll break off from you and I'll form my own church and I'll be the head of that church and then I can get my divorce as I want it. So that's actually how the Anglican Church comes about, is because Henry VIII says, nah, forget it, we're going to do our own thing. Now, to be fair, there are some theological differences that have started up um, kind of beneath the surface up until this point, uh, but that's actually the, the thing that makes the Anglican Church break off from the Roman Catholic Church. So there are a lot of different denominations that come about during this time. We've talked about some of those. Um, it's, it's all focused on going back to Scripture because so much of what led to the splintering in church history is that we put far more trust in the church than in the Scriptures themselves. Um, you consider a lot of the people, especially in this kind of time frame, can't read. And so they can't make up their own minds uh, as far as uh, theology is concerned. All we can do is trust what the church says to us, and the church starts to amass a lot of power. So Protestantism is really about going back to the scriptures and being able to understand for ourselves uh, what the scriptures teach. Um, and we would say that part of the issue that comes up is that the church has strayed uh, from the teachings of Scripture over time and instead placed a greater emphasis on the authority of the church itself rather than the Bible. So following, um, following the Reformation, we have a period of about 250 years or so where um, some of the uh, things that come about as a result of the Reformation are still being kind of worked out. And in the 1700s, we have uh, John Wesley shows up, and 
uh, he starts to say, you know what, the church has done well overall, but we need to actually find new life in the church. Uh, you know, things are kind of dying off a little bit, it seems like, but we want to pray that God would actually bring about new life in the church. And so uh, we find these revivals that start to take place. Uh, and revival is basically just a, a breathing of new life into the church, uh, into especially a denomination is usually what it is. Um, you can see tons and tons of instances of revival through the years. Uh, and it's, it's associated with an outpouring of the Spirit of God. Methodism itself, which is what John Wesley founded, Methodism is actually uh, a revival movement in and of itself. The Methodist Church came about from the Anglican Church um, to say, you know what, I think we need to go back to uh, what the church is supposed to be rather than what the Anglican Church is becoming. So uh, Methodism gives rise to Pentecostalism as well, uh, which you uh, see to this very day. All of these things come about because uh, we're trying to go back and make the church uh, the, the entity that it's supposed to be in a lot of ways. So I have said many times at this point that God does something new within his church about every 500 years. So if the last thing that took place, if the last kind of major thing that took place was the Reformation... Well, then we're actually overdue for God to do something new in the church today. I will say that by and large, the church is actually dying out in Europe and the Americas. Having said that, the church is growing drastically in Africa and in Asia. And we're actually seeing a shift in the uh, center of Christianity. We're seeing a shift in um, the power that we have in the church today. So the United States, we're losing out uh, in our grip on kind of the power in the church. Uh, and as I have said before, it seems like where Christianity is persecuted is where it grows the most. And wouldn't you know, uh, in places like Nigeria, in places like uh, China, where Christianity is very heavily persecuted, it's growing, and it's growing fast. Um, it, it, I would tend to say that the reason for that is because God identifies himself with the people who are overlooked and oppressed in society. And this is why so many people who are in poverty and, and in desperate situations turn to God because they recognize that he brings hope to those uh, who need him. So I am actually uh, finished for today. I will tell you that uh, <clears throat> I'm going to hang out for just a few minutes, as always, just to make sure that uh, I can answer any questions that you may have. You do not.